Hello, Humane Marketers. Sarah Znakrocha here. Welcome to another episode of the Humane Marketing Podcast, a place to be for the generation of marketers who cares. This is the show where we talk about marketing your business in a way that feels good to you, is aligned with your values, and also resonates more with your conscious customers because it's not pushy, ethical, and also beautiful. So if you're a regular here, you know that I'm organizing the conversations around the seven P's of humane marketing. And if you're new here and this is your first time, welcome. I'm so excited you're here. You may want to download your one-page marketing plan with the seven P's of humane marketing in the form of a mandala at humane.marketing forward slash one page, the number one and page. So again, humane.marketing forward slash one page. And with that, with no further ado, let's dive into today's conversation. Hi, Adam. How are you today? I am great. Thank you so much for, for having me here today. Yeah, we've been planning this for we can say over a year because you know it has been over the span of a year. So I'm so true, excited to, to have you yeah. here with us today and and talk about yeah an intriguing topic. So you so graciously let me share your concept of you know moving the pay line or you'll have to explain whether they are different concepts. This idea of income follows impact or moving the pay line, whether they're mm. the same or, or different ones. But yeah, we do we did share them, include them in the Selling Like We're Human book. And so I'm just excited to expand on this concept a little bit. So maybe you start off by, yeah, telling our list, maybe how you came up with this and, and then explaining the different ones, or if they're all uh, the same, just uh, going into details there. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Well, so we, we, you and I, we decided to talk a little bit more about the income follows impact, which is just a really clever way, I think, to kind of get people's attention. And we'll expand on that shortly. And I, you know, for anyone who picked that up, there is, a, there is an exercise, there is a mindset thing that I often do, which I call move the pay line, which is, which you graciously shared in, in your book. And I'd love to expand on that as well. And, and, and they, it goes hand in hand. It, it demonstrates how you actually deliver on the promise of income follows impact. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I jump into it and start to kind of define what impact means is, is really, if you, if you listen to it, what we're saying is if you make an impact, if you make a big enough difference in someone's life and or business, there is a way for you to make a good living or, you know, find some form of revenue at the end of that. And this really comes from the idea of, I think I picked this up from Seth Godin with this, like people are only willing to pay for something they see as a bargain. Like, so they, 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 they are, you know, they need to see value. And throughout my career working with, with clients and, you know, having in, conversations and sales conversations and enrollment calls and all of that. What I notice really makes the difference is to give people an experience versus explaining the concept. So for example, if, if I'm doing business coaching or if I'm doing something around life coaching, me avoiding just to explain what it could do for them, me instead showing them what that could do for them, always moves them closer to that decision of, hey, let's, let's do this, let's continue. And so through the work I did with my coach, Ankush Jane, at that point, we came up with that idea that income follows impact. The more impactful you can be as a coach, the less you will struggle as a coach. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times we, we, spend, we spend time on creating content, we spend time in, in being in conversations, and we're talking about coaching, we're talking about the outcome, what's possible. And this applies to anyone. If you're a trainer, healer, consultant, we're talking about, about the things that we can create versus actually giving them a, some form of experience of that. Mm -hmm. 
So that's what I apply to my business. It's what I try to help my clients see as well, that wherever you can, well, let's not just say let's wherever you can, but, but rather say where you can, try to give the experience before the concept. Try to give content before the concept, like give them context because then they will actually know. So that's kind of the income follows impact. And to be honest, um, anytime I feel a bit anxious about my bank account or the growth of my business, I can, I can go back and I can self-reflect and I can say, well, how much of a difference are you making? How much of an impact are you making? Right. And to be honest, it actually always puts me in a more creative mode when I go like, right, let's focus on impact here. Let's focus on making a difference versus right. Let's make more money. Mm. I, I just happen to believe, you know, be part of that group of people who are not necessarily driven by money, but impact. I mean, you, you talk about impact pioneers, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's definitely the, the, the tribe I subscribe to. And, and so, yeah, I, I think that's quick and easy explanation of income follows impact. Yeah, I love that. And, and what you just said, there's such a different energy to it when you say, you know, when you're kind of in this uh, scarcity thinking, feeling mode, and you're like, well, should I hustle more to, you know, get more clients? And then mm. that feels like more scarcity or mm. should I look at how can I make more impact? And that just kind of has this opening energy and it feels like, wow, <laughs> that is very, very different. So mm. yeah, I love that. I love that. Obviously that um, another kind of marketing concept that comes to mind is, is this idea of the no like, and trust factor, right? So I think that plays into it because if we are just talking about things, um, well, how will people know, like, and trust us? And, and, and mm. so by really experiencing you and what you can deliver, that helps with that know, like, and trust factor. Maybe, um, maybe we could give some examples because in the typical marketing you know path or funnel we, we usually think of the typical ebook or the free audio download mm. or, or things like that so yes that could be an option i guess to you know work with your impact or or trust factor but you are talking about experiences and and i don't think that an ebook would count as an experience a podcast may count as an experience mm. maybe but yeah tell me more of what you mean by experiences mm. good yes so i i think you're right there are degrees to facilitating an experience and really what i mean when i'm saying experience we want to go for trying to give an experience of what it looks like to work together so now, obviously, an ebook can sort of do that. And I, I would even say, if it's an ebook, you do want to make sure, I think, my personal recommendation is make sure that it's about them. Mm. What I mean by that is, like, don't try to prop yourself up too much. Like, make, make your clients, your customers, the hero of that story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it gives, the, it gives the experience of working with you, where it's like you're going to put them in the center and you're going to focus on them. So it can work because they can feel like, wow, he's 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 really committed to, to my growth or our growth. Wow, she really sees the individual here. That alone can shift things right away. And then obviously we can move up the ladder and we can go to podcasts, which is probably even better because you get to listen to the, you know, the, the tone of the voice, the pacing, the expressions, the warmth or the you know, the depth to whatever we, we're uh, able to convey. So that's another way. Actually, Can I, I just uh, yeah. get, get in there and ask something because I was just listening to a podcast today and I made this reflection where I think the less, the less kind of, you know, bells and whistles a podcast has to me. So you know how we all kind of got used to the super intro with like you hire this voice and it sounds like really whoa look at this show and here is Sarah's and a coach so the less kind of professional almost maybe the word is it is the more I feel connected 
to the host. And mm. I was wondering about that because I, I've kind of given myself permission over the years to do these news episodes where it's just me talking and, you know, they're way easier for me to create. I just hit record mm. and do some um, audio editing, not, you know, not cutting out any words, but just kind of improving the audio and, and then off, off I go. But it was a big struggle to think, what are people going to think? This is not as professional as all the other ones. But then today I noticed, you know what? I love this podcast host, but yet I feel so detached because they're, I don't feel like I'm having a real experience with them. I just feel like they're talking to a huge audience. What do you mm. think about that? Well, I think you're really onto something here, and especially going back to what, what you represent with the humane marketing and humane selling, I, I think authenticity is, is what comes up for me, right? That we want to have real authentic connections to the people we, we surround ourselves with. And it is part of what, what I actually think is what I talk about when I talk about impact. Because one of the, I think, misunderstandings or myths possibly in our industry of, of being a helper is that we need to be gurus. We need to be put on pedestals and we need to be celebrities. And, you know, for anyone who can't see this, I'm smiling as I'm saying it, there's a little bit of a, like, you know, a bit humor in this. Of course, there's nothing wrong with having a following or something like that. It's just, I believe that the power in, and I'm going to refer to coaching or helping, the power of the helping happens through the relationship. Because I, I can give you all the best tools in the world. And if our relationship is off, most likely you're not going to receive them. Like you're not going to receive them the way I intended for them to be received because we're, we're having an issue with how we're listening to each other, how we're connected. And if, if we start our relationship where you look at me and put me on a pedestal, meaning that you're looking up at me, mm -hmm. uh, chances are we're already in an unbalanced relationship. Mm -hmm. If you're looking up at me, you might be afraid of making mistakes. You might be afraid of confessing that you didn't do your homework, that you failed. And all of a sudden, we can't go as, as, as deep as we need to for your sake because you're not being honest. Mm. So my fame, my celebrity status is actually damaging the relationship and therefore the potential of my client. Right. Now, you also don't want to have them look down upon you, like which is really weird if they did. But what I mean by that is we don't want to be and this might be a touchy subject, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. We don't want to overshare. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be over vulnerable. Vulnerability is a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. And I just think we, we want to be mindful around that. And what I mean then is we, we want to avoid role reversals where our clients all of a sudden feel like they need to comfort us. That creates a very weird dynamic. And yet I see this happen. I see this happen in group programs. I see this happen in conversations where we overshare something that we're simply not in a, in a space to share yet. Mm -hmm. It's too raw. Mm -hmm. Now, where we do want to be is really human to human, eye level to eye level, mm -hmm. if, if yeah. that's how you say it, right? Because at that point, it's, it's a more mutual, respectful, human a connection. And I think anything that we can to provide that kind of experience in an ebook, a podcast, a video, even in our emails, right? The more we do that, the I think the stronger the relationship becomes and the better for, for the client in, in terms of the potential. Mm -hmm. So what that looks like is probably very individual based on who you are and what your brand is about. And as you said, perhaps it is about less bells and whistles, and more connection. Mm. Okay, thanks for exploring that side tangent with me. But <laughs> it's just, yeah, it, it, it kind of just was brought up today. Yeah. So I was like, oh, let me ask him that. So no, I like it, though. Yeah. yeah, let's go back to the, the idea of, yeah, we were talking about podcasts as being one mm. of the things that we can offer, what would be some other experiences? <laughs> Well, another thing you, you brought up as an example in your book, Selling Like We're Human, you, you went on to explain a little bit about when I hosted my summits in the beginning of last year, 
where I, as, as far as I could, as much as I could, I was sending personal video messages to everyone who signed up. Mm -hmm. And it was a free event to sign up for. So there were quite a few uh, messages to go, go out. Mm -hmm. And I sent a video message where I would say, you know, wave and say, that, mention their name and say, I'm glad to have you here. I hope you find this interesting. And I used to add something personal based on that day and, and you know, the mood I was in. I add some software to help me with that. So that made it easier because it might be a bit tricky to figure that out otherwise. And that was just something that I wanted to commit to as a way to already give people way before they even join the, the, the summit or way before they even start to reaching out to me. They are hearing my voice. They're seeing my body language. They're seeing my, my, my facial expressions. They're getting an experience. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. yet another way to, again, give the experience uh, way before people even start working with you. Yeah, and they, they really feel, and I think they felt, those people who signed up for your uh, summit, they felt heard and seen as, you know, participants of the summit. It's not just, uh, you know, here's a mass email that we all know by now, okay, yeah, he's not really talking to me personally. So having that personal touch is, of course, yeah, it's it's one of the ways to to create impact. I, I couldn't agree. I guess, would it be helpful for me to expand on the move the pay line concept yeah, to kind of there. give people an idea of yeah. what can they do for, for themselves? Mm -hmm. So the idea that I was fortunate enough to share in your book, Move the Pay Line, is, is this idea that, well, we had that analogy in the book. So let me start with that. So you picture yourself on a beach where you've got your bare feet in, 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 in the sand and you have a stick in your hand and you, you draw a line uh, from top to bottom towards your feet. So there's like two columns, there are two sides beyond that, that line in, in the sand. And to the right of that line, in the right column, you start writing things that you do with your clients once they sign up with you, once they pay you, and they start working with you in, in some form of container. You start adding, like, I'll send out uh, workbooks. I'm sending out my, my ebook that I wrote two years ago. I give them access to my oh, summits that I used to run. We create strong agreements. I give them access to me via, via WhatsApp. And of course, we have conversations and all of that. Just a, just a few examples, right? Now, if we've listed and exhausted our, our resources or our ideas to what we do once someone becomes our client, we can then move on to the, the left side of that line, to the left column. And on this side, we're asking ourselves, what could I borrow from the right side onto the left side? Left side being... How can I give people an experience before they pay me? So now the line symbolizes uh, before and after payment. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, I can look at all the things I provide as a part of the experience of, of being a paying client. Are there versions of that I can share already way before they become my clients? Mm -hmm. Maybe I can give access to parts of my summit. Maybe I can give out my ebook. Maybe there are ways for me to send messages that are really directed to that individual, just as I would once they become my clients. And so all of a sudden, we're moving the pay line in, in terms of like we're almost kind of moving it up into what we already offer as, as for our pay, paying clients. Again, this way, it just helps. We don't have to come up with something new. We can just revise and review what we have and go, how can I? put this out? How can I give people access to this? How can I provide an experience before they have to pay me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. As you know, in the selling like we're human book, I'm calling the signposts that mm. that's what a signpost is to me is this idea of, you know, gently leading your ideal client along the path to maybe eventually end up in your serene garden where you do have a sales conversation. But in the meantime, you give them all these benches where they can rest and they can sit down and, and yeah, kind of, you know, listen to your podcast or to your summit and, and whatever not you're sharing with them. And what I like also what you said is that it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, something new, a new a whole course that you're creating or, 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 you know, how we get into 
like there's a lot of talk about funnels and how we come up people come up with these really complicated funnels and it doesn't have to be complicated it can really just be well what am I already doing and pull some things up to the other side so I I, I love this concept of just saying well what do I do already that you know doesn't cost me anything obviously we're not wanting you to you know, necessarily spend, you know, free coaching or, or, or any of that. And that's up to you if you decide to do that. But, but that's not the idea here. It's like, what do I have already that I can give for free and help with that, you know, guidance towards the, the serene garden? Yeah, I love that. I mean, if I can expand just quickly on this, yeah. this is actually something that was really is really current for me. And I've, I've been fortunate enough now to be in really strong conversations around this. I have noticed, and it's something that I've taken for granted for quite some time, and I have noticed that asking questions is, is definitely the way, I mean, especially in my case, I'm a coach. So asking questions is kind of what I do. So when I slow things down, and now we're talking about people who are reaching out or coming in via email or WhatsApp, there's an introduction being made, and I'm connected with someone. Mm -hmm. Normally, the typical thing that perhaps I would do or anyone else would do is <clears throat> just because that person came in, we know there's an interest, we say, fantastic, here's my Calendly link, or here's my, yeah, any, any calendar link that we use to schedule something. Or, or something. Exactly. Mm -hmm sign up here and uh, let's get on a call, mm -hmm. right? That's a typical thing because we're really quick on it. Right. Now, again, if we, first of all, I think pre-qualifying can be useful. And especially because this is the side I'm seeing right now. The really cool thing is because I've been really busy. So I've been having to pre-qualify people. I've been having to extend some of the time I spend with people. And so I've been asking more questions. Mm -hmm. And the really cool thing happened just a couple of weeks ago where someone came into my, my sphere and, and I started asking questions and I kept asking questions and I had her come up with, well, seeing deeper and deeper. And as like, even the first message I sent her, she was like, oh my God, those are great questions. And this is also a coach. So I, I found that really humbling that she felt like, oh, those were really good questions. And we kept going. The day after that, I receive randomly from my website, someone going through my application form to sign up for a free conversation with me. They went through, they scheduled a, a conversation with me. And usually I have an idea of who's coming in and who's, who's not. So this was a random person. I, I couldn't recognize the name. And we were starting having a conversation because of the email coming in. And she, she told me, well, I came in because you're in conversation with uh, another woman and she recommended me to reach out to you and that's the woman I'm texting with so mm -hmm. she's already having an experience of the possibility that's on offer here so much so that she's willing to even say to someone she knows you know what you, you should probably have a look at his website you should probably look into this guy mm -hmm. and that that woman then goes through and and kind of comes out the other side of of being in my calendar mm -hmm. now I, I'm sharing that just to say kind of highlight the power of again giving the experience so even before I'm, I'm i'm accepting anyone before we get on a call before there's money exchanged she's experiencing the possibility of working together through the questions through me having her see more yeah yeah that is powerful and instead of uh, you know maybe increasing the filters and saying no let me you know block you out we can just engage in the questions and from there still then decide, you know, is this a good fit or, or not? Yeah. So, and, uh, and you mentioned this thing that it doesn't have to cost a lot. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say that, that part of what I tend to do is I, I send other people's resources. I've sent your book uh, to people. I've made sure that they listen to episodes of your podcast. I, I have a list. I, I've got a lot list. I call the ultimate resource list. Right. right. And I just keep adding things there. If I watch a really good YouTube uh, video, I'll add it to that. Now we can send other people's resources right. and we can say, Hey, if you enjoy that, we should get on a call and explore that. Mm -hmm. Right. So already asking questions, sending them useful resources, having them do some homework 
even before they start working with us. Having them experience transformations way before they start paying us mm -hmm. is a beautiful way to introduce the idea of the experience rather than the concept. I love and that. Yeah. I'm not going to say anymore because clearly I can talk about this forever, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's, I hope we're g giving some ideas to the, the audience, the listeners on, on how they can start doing pieces of this themselves. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like that a lot. This, this idea of experience versus, I guess, transaction I, I, mm. I word that comes up. So, yeah. Yeah. I want to steer you in another direction. I think a lot of the listeners, they are, and you notice you're in the circle where you know, heart-centered entrepreneurs were impact pioneers. So mm. we are, you don't need to tell us uh, you need to give before you get. Usually that's, you know, we're good at that. And so I think that is a great advantage. And it can also get to the point where it becomes a disadvantage or it becomes a challenge. I know I share about the my overgiving burnout in the marketing like we're human book. And I know that you have kind of have a an, an, an overgiving or or just kind of a burnout moment as well in, in mm. your previous career. So maybe tell us about the that burnout story and what it was linked to. And then yeah, how do we how do we deal with that? How do we still give and yet also make sure that we are, you know, safe and healthy and, mm. and happy. Yeah, th this is an important topic, especially for, as you said, heart-centered entrepreneurs. So my own personal experience, and I, I've, I've had it several times, like it's, it's you know, I, I think it's, to me, it was just, it's a tendency, it's a strength, and it's also one of my greatest potentials. So in, in my corporate career, I, I had a burnout because I was just con continuously saying, if only I have X, then things will be better. And I kept saying that. It was like the carrot on a stick just dangling in front of me. And I was continuously saying, like, I'll just get to that point, then everything will be fine. I got to that point, but something else was now not not good. And I continued and I continued. And finally, I just couldn't get out of bed. I clearly went way beyond my boundaries. So that was part of what I needed to understand. And I did come up with an idea after that, which has been really helpful in, in, in my coaching, in my personal life as well. And it is this to kind of fill your own cup first. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I call this energy management. So I have this idea that, and we all know this, like recharging our batteries and filling our own cup is, is often a really powerful way to do, especially if we're helpers, because we're, we're far more effective when our cups are full or our batteries are full. The challenge, though, is that we tend to fill it up and then we start giving again. And, you know, because we're giving, the levels decrease. Mm -hmm. And now we're down to 30, 30 percent. And all of a sudden we only have a maximum capacity of 30 to give, whereas if I would have been back on hundreds, I could have given much, much more. So my personal insight, my, my solution to that became to fill my cup up and keep filling because it's the overflow that I then share freely. Mm. And so for me, it was about figuring out what fills my cup. And once I figure that out, make sure that it never gets turned off. So I start my day, I, I make sure that part of my agenda is to fill my cup and keep it full. Because then if I move into a space of service, there's no depletion, because it's an ever flowing flow. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I love that picture. It's just like, the minute it's empty, it's filling again, and then you share whatever is, you know, dripping over. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it has a lot to do with you know, abundance, like that's what abundance is, is that that's when you can really share from this energy of abundance, because the minute you feel like, oh, there's less and, you know, I'm not feeling great and there's not enough for me. Well, guess what? You're not in abundance anymore. You're now in scarcity. And so that's mm. also where this stress then comes from. The other term, um, you mentioned boundaries, so I think that's a, an important part of mm. it, right? Like, uh, yeah. we're not we're not inviting you to just give without limits. Yes, you know, first of all, yeah, have your cup always full, but even then, 
there's boundaries like if someone asks you uh, do you work for free well no of course not you know there, there are boundaries that you need to put in place do you work mm. on the weekends no if 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 you don't want to work on the weekends then that's a big no so there is uh, yeah big importance on on boundaries and, and and working on those and the i'll let you in in a second the other term i wanted to throw at you was ambition so mm. talk to us about boundaries and and then also ambition perfect yeah exactly i, I wanted to make that connection so it's with, with the with the boundaries the idea i like to talk about around that is really when it comes to our us being heart-centered entrepreneurs, helpers, we want to understand that there is a distinction here. There is being passionate about what you do and, and also being a pro. And in, in early days when I started things, I was just passionate. I was, I was on a mission. <laughs> I had a purpose and I was giving. Again, I, I, I told you, I burnt out several times, not just at my corporate uh, career, but also doing what I'm doing today. So I've, I've, I've had to learn that and relearn that. And part of that is when things shifted for me, I, I was working with a coach who helped me see that there is a distinction by turning into a pro. One can, one can argue it's, it's a question about the social self and the professional self. The social self wants to be liked and is afraid of saying no and putting boundaries in. The professional self is the side that says, well, actually, I realize when I'm depleted, I'm doing a far less, less um, impactful work than I otherwise could. So because of that, I limit the number of calls, the number of hours I work per week, so that I can guarantee to people to always show up on a high frequency, for example. Right. So that, so that the distinction I'm trying to allow people to see is really turn, turn pro, like, Start treating this as a business, not as a hobby, not as just a passion project. I mean, if, if that's what you want, of course, to turn this into a business. And if we do, we are professionals. Be proud of that and, and honor that. And it does tie into this idea of ambition and defining your success. Mm -hmm. right? Because if, if we don't define what success looks like to us, it is easy to overdo it. It is easy to think, well, five clients are pro is probably better than, than four, so let's go for five. Well, that's the whole thing, right? Is it really to you, for you? Maybe four clients is perfect for you because it allows you to have that time, that space to recharge and always make sure that you're coming from a place of full. Maybe it gives you time to grow, learn, and, and stay on top of things, and so on and so on. So you want to take charge of that because ambition is a tricky thing. Like we could probably have a whole conversation about this because that was my key, key learning when I shifted away from, from what, where I was. There is like in human beings, we have this amazing ability to be ambitious. It is, a, it is an amazing ability because you don't see this everywhere else. Like if you look at animals, for example, they're not very ambitious. They're very concerned about the, the, the present moment, surviving. Humans, though, we put away money today so that we possibly can use that when we retire. That's very ambitious. That's very, how do you say that? For, forward, yeah, thinking, yeah. forward thinking, yeah. And, and at the same time, if all you have is ambition, you will struggle with actually living in the present moment. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, life really happens only in the present moment. Mm -hmm. So we're missing out on a big piece of, of life. So the opposite of ambition is enthusiasm, according to me. Mm -hmm. So we, it's one thing to use ambition. And we also want to balance that with enthusiasm, meaning the exci excitement we feel in the present moment. Right. And so, again, what can help us not to go too far, which is a typical thing when we measure money, we measure followers, we measure tangible metrics is that 10 is good 11 is better 11 is good 15 is even better and then we just like kind of start rolling because the ambition takes over yeah. that's when we can start going what's my upper limit what's the limit that i i would be happy to reach 
without necessarily sacrificing or, or crossing my boundaries, sacrificing my boundaries, so that I can make sure to come from a place of abundance first. Does this tidy all together, Sarah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's so good. And I'm so glad you you mentioned this upper limit. I, I think it's, we are so brainwashed to always think about growth and more growth and more growth and that you know the conversation of what if there was an upper limit and what if and and obviously we're talking about money here as well right what if i reach that upper limit and then i can really just do the things that fill my cup and then if it still brings me joy then yeah maybe i i can do some more because Obviously, we've also all chosen work that we love doing, but that's mm. also where the danger is, I think, in, in our work. I mean, yes, it's great that we get to work and, and love it. And at the same time, you can fall so much in love with your work that in the end, you're still working all the time, you know? And, and yeah. then, uh, yeah, I think it's, it can be addictive. So, so I think it's, a, it's worth having a conversation, you know, especially if you have a partner and loved ones and, and you're like, well, actually, yeah, I do love my work, but you know, how do they fit into the equation as well? So, mm. so yeah, so good to have this and, and yeah, enthusiasm is a, is a great word and curiosity as well you know where where it's like well yeah i have this ambition but i have all this curiosity for other things that i want to mm -hmm. do that maybe don't have to do with work and you know maybe if i do have this upper limit then i have more time for following my curiosity so curiosity yeah. is one of my core values so it's it's just like yeah i do want to do all these other things as well so so good yeah is there anything that we haven't talked about yet that you wanted to bring up with this idea of moving the pain pain well I, I was thinking about one other thing once we you know as I was preparing in my mind about this and it was this not to make this a big thing so a very small distinction that can sometimes help to understand what it means to focus on impact and it is it is this idea of don't don't look for clients look for ways to be helpful so whenever someone feels stuck like I can't find clients where do I find clients well Let's not focus on clients. Let's focus on helping people, being helpful. And, and again, obviously going back to what we just shared about boundaries and turning pro and defining success so that it actually makes sure to uh, support your lifestyle goals. When we start looking for ways to be helpful, the spin-off effect, the side effect of that is often a, a person becoming a client. Mm -hmm. It just, it, it sort of happens by itself. And it, to me, I, I found that to be quite helpful when, when the anxiety of, oh, I need clients. When that com comes up, I just go like, hang on, let's be helpful. Where can I be helpful? Because it's easy to find that than finding clients. I, I, I don't walk around seeing dollar signs above people's heads, right? It's just not what I do. Yeah. Yeah, what that brings up is, is when I uh, used to co-organize the LinkedIn local events here in, in Lausanne, we, we organized that with a friend and people came to these networking events, like you said, looking for clients. Mm. And I always told them, don't, your clients are not here. Mm. These are people, humans that may just know other humans who need, you know, what you have to offer. But yeah, it's never a good idea to go to a networking event and think those are all my potential clients. Like you give off the wrong energy if you go into a room like yeah. that. So, so yeah. yeah, just thinking, oh, these are humans who may know other humans who, who are then, yeah, potentially going to have want to work with me. But, but also don't think, oh, I'm going to tell them now <laughs> that, you know, tell all your friends about me. No, that's mm. not the plan either. <laughs> 
Well, That's a good point. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Adam. I want you to share uh, two things. First of all, where people can find you, how they can find out how to work with you. And uh, second, I think you have something where you walk your talk and people can really experience what it would be like to be in your circles. So tell us. Yeah, exactly. Well, the easiest way, I guess, is that you, you can just visit my website, which is Adam Kowalik, K-A-W-A-L-E-C.com. And there you can get in touch with me. You can read more about the things that I do together with my, my clients. And you can send me an email from there as well. I am on social media, but I'm not a huge, huge fan or like a, a very, very present person there. So it can take some time before I see something. If you really want to make sure to get in touch with me, send me an email. That's the, that's the best way. And yes, so I, I really, I mean, I enjoyed our conversations and we started getting to know each other a year ago. And I was so happy when you decided to, you were accepting my invitation to be part of my summit that I did last year calling the authentic business building and marketing summit and authenticity to me like that was just I just needed you to be part of that and I'm so glad I did and you said yes so to honor that kind of I I wanted to offer all the listeners a way to um, access the the one interview I did with you and two additional interviews that are really on the topic of authenticity and connection and providing experience for people so and they they can go again to my, my home website and it's adamkowalik.com forward slash humane marketing, human marketing podcast. And that's where they can basically sign up for, for to access those three videos. And I'm sure that you'll link that somewhere around this episode as well. In the show notes and in the description of your, of your app where you're listening to this podcast. So yeah, wow. that's wonderful. A generous offer. Thank you. Yeah. And that summit was just so great. So Thank you so much. I have a final question, Adam. What are you grateful for today or this week? Mm. I am going to say that I'm back running, that I'm really grateful for, for being back running. It's I, I took a bit of a uh, pause during you know, holidays and all of that. And today was my first day back running. And I'm really grateful for that. Like it's it's one of my, that's one of the things that really fills my cup. And I can tell because the last few weeks, there's slowly, slowly been some only drippings happening for happening for my my refilling my cup. Mm -hmm. So I want to say that, yeah, running, nature, moving the body. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being on the show, Adam. Really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for watching and being part of a generation of marketers who cares for yourself, for your clients, and for the planet. We really are change makers before we are marketers. So go ahead, be the change you want to see in the world. And I hope to see you again next week. Take care.